Hey everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History, and as you know, we are currently in the process of publishing this book, Stuka, the Doctorate of the German Dive Bomber. This is, of course, thanks to all of you who have already pledged to support this project over on Indiegogo. You have blazed past that funding goal and you've made all the stretch goals possible as well so we even had to add some more and yeah it is thanks to you that this book is of course coming out and the campaign will be ending soon so if you want a copy of this book and if you want to put your order in best do it relatively soon rather than sometime later you can do so of course by following the link in the description below or by going directly to stukabook.com but what i want to do now is as a little bit of a special thank you to all of you take you through the official dive bombing procedure of the ju87 now this information comes straight out of the manual and even though dive bombing seems relatively straightforward right i mean you have an aircraft you push the nose down you go towards your target you drop your bombs and you pull out and that's the job done it's actually quite an intricate procedure in some ways. There are certain things you have to think about. And going through the official manual, I think we can find some interesting points there that uh, might be both relevant to you as an aviation enthusiast or somebody who perhaps also uses flight simulators and that sort of stuff. So without further ado, let me demonstrate. For this, I will use the JU-87D3, which is available in the IL-2 Great Battle series with the Battle of Stalingrad module. This will give us a close approximation, at least from a visual standpoint, on how to dive bomb. There are some minor differences when it comes to the dive attack compared to other models, like the B-2, but nothing that concerns us now. After flying to the target area, the first thing we need to do is identify the target. Here we're going to be attacking a ship. We can see that it is heading along the coast from the northwest to the southeast. Using the coastline as a heading reference, we fly towards it until nearly perpendicular to the target. We want to approach from its stern to make it easier to aim our bombs and prevent us from exceeding the maximum dive angle of 90 degrees should we have misjudged our timing. Of course, here I am in the ideal scenario where time is not an issue. Turning towards the target, we make a note of its position parallel to the coast. Here the distinctive coastline, as well as the lake next to it, give us a handy reference point for the approximate location of the ship. It doesn't travel that fast after all. So remember this as we turn the nose to fully obscure the target. We open our bombing window and follow the course towards the ship. If necessary, final adjustments to the aircraft's trim are made now. The manual actually recommends a slight nose down trim so that you require less manual input during the dive. We would then engage the arming sequence, set the bombs to dive bombing, choose the desired bomb pattern and whether we want a delay or not. Although not all of this is modeled in IL-2 and it also really depends on the bombs we're using. Anyway, I'm just using a generic single 500 kilogram bomb for this demonstration. Now I will take you through the pre-dive sequence as written in the manual. This is relatively simple and although on first look might appear as a long list of things to do, it can be done very quickly so there is no real timing requirement on whether you can already see the target or not. You set your RPM to a maximum of 2250 RPMs per minute or lower. You then set your contact altimeter to the desired drop altitude. Depending on your aircraft's weight and your dive angle, a JU-87 usually requires a pullout radius of between 300 to 900 meters, including safety margins. So depending on target, target altitude, weight and altitude, you set this contact altimeter to either a setting previously agreed upon or your own very personal one. You verify that the supercharger is set to automatic. And then as we get closer to the target, you turn on the siren which came with an on-off switch in the D model. Except that I don't have sirens installed. Usually the dive bombing units had a rather poor opinion of these and often would not fit them unless explicitly ordered. By looking either through the bombing window or using your own reference landmark, we can see that we are getting close to our dive position. So let's reduce the throttle to idle. You then close the radiators for the oil and liquid cooling. And finally you deploy the air brakes. This automatically results in a strong nose down tendency as the aircraft's dive recovery system turns on at the same time. However, you can still use manual input on your control stick to counter this. 
Finally, you turn on the Scheibenspülanlage. It's a windscreen defogger device with outside air being blown into the cabin from below the three windows in front of you to prevent them from fogging up during the dive. Unsurprisingly, this is not modeled in the actual simulation. And as you are ready for the dive, you push the aircraft's nose down in one smooth control motion. You could also roll in, it's a personal choice, although rolling in helps you if you have already overflown the target and wish to return directly into the direction you came from in the first place. In popular memory, the JU-87 has this image of coming straight down at 90 degrees. In reality, the angle depended on target, altitude, weather conditions, experience, target size and enemy defenses, and they could be as shallow as 40 degrees against relatively unprotected targets. Here, I am opting for a close to 90 degree angle though. As I am lucky with the weather conditions and don't need to compensate too much, I aim the plane into the ship's path. Minimal adjustments to roll and yaw can still be made, but should be done as soon as possible. Sometimes this is required to compensate for any sort of drift. Keep the plane steady and have an eye on your speedometer. You should not be going over 550 to 600 km per hour. 250 meters above the altitude you set into your contact altimeter, a warning sound will turn on. It will sound until you reach the desired altitude, usually 2-3 to three seconds. Once it turns off, you drop your bombs. I have mine on a delay fuse. Depending on the JU-87 model, this would initiate the dive recovery automatically. This returns the starboard trim tabs to a neutral setting, making recovery easier. However, you still need to pull yourself and level out the plane. Once level, retract the air brakes, increase RPMs to 2400, throttle up to 1.25 ATA, and open the radiators. And it looks like we scored a hit. Alright, so that's how you dive bomb with a JU-87 straight out of the manual. Granted, in simulations like IL-2, the official way might not always be the best way, but overall, this gives you a good approximation of what it would have looked like in reality. Remember to check out our new book, Stuka, The Doctrine of the German Dive Bomber, for more information on the JU-87. It comes with a fantastic collection of translated primary sources, for example on the roles and the organization of the Sturzkampfgeschwader, the dive bombing units, a dive bombing manual, experience reports from pilots, and with plenty additional reference information. Check out stukabook.com and secure your copy before the campaign ends. As always, thank you very much for watching, have a great day, and see you in the sky.